Good morning. morning. How you guys doing? Good. You guys are much better than the other services. I'll just say that. (laughs) Well, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year's. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that we did in my family. Um, Christmas Eve, we had five services here. Rich talked about that. It was awesome. If you went to one of those services, it was awesome to spend that time with you. Now, like, my wife and I were both on staff, and um, so Christmas Eve and Easter and, and different things like that, th- those are like all-day events for us, which is, is it's a, actually a lot of fun. Um, what also is fun is that that is um, a really good opportunity for our moms to watch our kids. So <laughs> it's a full-day event for them, too. Um, so this past, this past Christmas Eve, um, something happened. Um, while my mom was watching uh, my, my two kids, something snuck into our house. Um, and my, so Kristen and I are, are uh, you know, here and working and we get this video and we're kind of shocked. Um, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> like, it's the size of her. Like she's running because she's about to topple over. Like I, I learned a lot about the wise men at Christmas Eve services, but I also learned how sneaky grandmas are. So um, <laughs> she knew we weren't home. I would not let them in my house. I don't know where I'm going to put that. <laughs> well, if you're like, that's hilarious, but I don't know who that guy is. My name is Tyler Woolley, and I have the honor of um, spending time in student ministries. That is what I get to do. It's a lot of fun. Yep, go student ministries. Um, if you didn't know we had student ministries, surprise, we do. And it's awesome. Um, we meet Sunday night. So if you're in high school or middle school, come and check that out. Um, we have winter camp coming up. That is a big deal for us as well. So sign up for that. And then tonight um, from five to seven, we actually have our um, New Year's Eve party. So we're excited about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, You should come to that. It's going to be good. Um, Speaking of which, the year's almost over. Did you guys have a good year? It's been a crazy one, right? Um, My wife and I welcomed our second child into the world. His name is Jack. I mean, come on. (laughs) Right? He's cute. He's going to get whatever he wants. Except not a giant unicorn, right? (laughs) Uh, So in the next 24 hours, we begin a new year. And a lot of times that is where we have a clean slate. We make all these resolutions. We make all these goals for the next year. They can be as serious as, you know, I want to get healthier. I want to lose 10 pounds. Or they can be as ridiculous as eat more bacon. That's a real one. I saw that. It was written down. <laughs> regardless, regardless of what, what those are and what that looks like, it's a great thing to look forward into the new year, Right? But I think that we would be ignorant and we would be foolish to say that it's great for everyone. Starting a new year can also be really hard, right? It can feel like a continuation of a really hard year that you are wrapping up, right? I know I've had those years before where uh, everything feels like it's falling apart. You know, you just seem, can't seem to catch a break, anything like that, right? It's hard to look forward to a monster of a year when you've just finished a monster of a year, right? It's hard to make resolutions. It's hard to have that New Year's excitement. It's hard to see past the things that are difficult. It's hard to see that God is being faithful when we are faced with difficult things. I think think that's, that's a fact. Now, this is not a new thing. This is not a new thing. Like, we read about it over and over and over again in Scripture. We we see people, and they can't see the faithfulness of the Lord because of the mountain that they are facing, right? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at one of those stories. If you guys would pray with me, um, and then we'll get started. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people, Lord. God, as we read your word, Lord, I pray that that you be heard, that my words fall aside, what's not important falls away, and, uh, and what is important 
remains. In your name, amen. So we're going to be kicking it old school, Old Testament um, in Numbers. And so if you want to tr- turn to chapter 14, um, that would be great. And I'm going to give you kind of a backstory of kind of where we're, where we're picking the story up. Now, um, the Israelites, they have been through a lot. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, they've been on this journey to um, the promised land. God has promised them um, this land. And so they're right outside of this land. Um, and what they do is that they send in some spies to check it out. You know, they want, they want to see what it looks like. They want to know who lives there. They want to know what it's going to take for them to inhabit this land. And so the spies come back with proof that this land is fruitful. Literally, they bring back tons of fruit. And they're like, this all grows in that land. As they put it, the land flows with milk and honey. That was exciting to them. That sounds like a mess to me. But, um, <laughs> but there's only one problem with their report. That in the land currently are very big very strong people that inhabit the land. And at this, the Israelites feel completely defeated. They are upset. And that's kind of where we pick up. So chapter 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into a land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And then they said to one another, let us choose a leader and let's go back to Egypt. Now, this is a big claim. If you know anything about the Israelites, you know that in Egypt, they were slaves. Not only were they slaves, but they were slaves for 430 years in Egypt. They were beaten and they were mistreated and they were taken advantage of in Egypt. And their rights to worship their God was taken away from them in Egypt. And this is where they want to go back to. They have lost their faith. They have lost their faith that that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And instead of moving forward into the situation that is uncomfortable and unknown, they would rather stay where they know what to expect. And for them, that is slavery and that is suffering. So like I said, it's a big claim. Now from us looking in from the outside, does that, does that make sense? No. Not so much. But we face similar things, right? I mean, I've never experienced having to charge into a land and fight giants, but um, I have definitely faced things, and we have faced things where we would rather stay where we are comfortable than move into something that's uncomfortable and unknown, right? When I was thinking about this, a specific situation um, came to mind. For the past couple years, I have gotten the privilege to um, lead a small group of high schoolers to Kenya, Africa um, with Cure International. It was an amazing experience. I, I loved it. It's definitely one of my favorite parts of my job. Now, Cure International has hospitals all over the world, and they primarily focus on um, physical deformity. So club foot, cleft palate. They also um, focused on hydrocephalitis and spina bifida. Now, both times that we were out there at this hospital in Kajabi, Kenya, um, my, uh, the hospital's focus was uh, cleft palate. And so hundreds of people come to this hospital um, and they bring their children because when, you, when you're repairing a cleft palate, oftentimes that's You want to do it when they're young. So as they grow, it develops and and different things like that. So these babies, usually two and under, these babies come for this procedure. And the procedure is going to make their life better. They're going to be able to nurse better. They're going to be able to receive better nutrients. They're going to have an overall healthier life. But in Africa, it's a much bigger deal than that. You see, when you were born with a physical deformity... 
you and your mother are oftentimes seen as cursed. And so that's, that's a big deal for these moms and these children who are coming because oftentimes they are, they are seen as outcasts. And so as, as my team uh, starts like interacting and playing with these kids, they're very timid. They, 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 like, they, don't, they don't really smile. They're very like guarded. And the reason is, and the reason that we found out is because there's a good chance that we and the hospital staff are the first people to show these kids love other than their parents, which is kind of messed up. So I'm walking around, and I, and I sit down with this mom, and I'm like, hey, how, how, can, how can I pray for you? And of course, she says, you know, pray for my baby's safety. And that's when it hit me. That this mom, yes, her, her, her child is going to benefit from this surgery, but her mom had to make the conscious decision for her child to be operated on. And if you have ever had to have that, I do not envy you. She was being operated on by someone they didn't know. They didn't know if there was going to be a, if it was going to be a successful surgery. Like the Israelites, this mom could have been like, nope, we're not going to do it. There's too much unknown. It's uncharted territory. I don't know how God is going to handle this, right? She had to make a decision that was scary for her, that was scary for her helpless child. And she had to take a step of faith into the unknown and into the uncomfortable. When I was thinking about this, I'm like, well, where am I at? Do I stay where I know? Do I stay where I'm comfortable when I'm met with things that are hard? Or do I push forward? Do I rely on God? Do I trust him? Do I walk into that unknown? I would love to stand up here and tell you that I always do the latter. But you all know that I'd be lying, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> this is something that we all struggle with. This is all something that's hard. So where are you at? Is God calling you to do something scary? Is God calling you to move into something that you, that's kind of unknown? If there's something that's coming to mind, I would encourage you, write it down. Write it down in the bulletin. Write it down in your Bible. Write it down on your phone, whatever. But like, let it be something that you pray about. Let it be something that you ask for courage about. So we're going to jump right back into scripture. Now, some of the spies speak up about the land um, and kind of what, what they saw. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land that we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into that land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Now, I work with high school and middle schoolers, right? I think we've established that. Um, and so it's, it's fair to say that I've seen my, my, share, my fair share of drama. Um, I love them. I love the high school and middle schoolers, but tis the season for drama. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I have to be honest. When I read this scripture, when I read about people falling on their faces and ripping their clothes, I think about your teenagers. <laughs> and my three-year-old. So... <laughs> But in all seriousness, when we see, that the, see these dramatic acts written about, um, it's conveying deep mourning and grief. So these leaders, these leaders are full-on grieved and frustrated that their people have lost their faith. They are trying to make them see the goodness of what the Lord has for them. They're like, this is the best of the best. In that land is what the Lord wants to bless us with. 
The Lord has brought us this far. Why would he stop now? These are the words of the wise. These are the select few people in the group that still have faith and can see the bigger picture. How many of you have someone like that in your life? You know, you're, you're up against something hard. You're dealing with a really difficult situation. And they're the person that you go and you talk to and they speak life back into that situation. We're all going to deal with hard things, things that are going to test our faith. But when that happens, we not only struggle with our faith, we struggle with perspective. We talk about this thing in student ministries called the crystal ball mentality. Now, this is not, this is not just in student ministries. This happens all over, but we talk about it more in student ministries. And basically what it is, it's what happens when we lose perspective. The crystal ball mentality is like, listen, things are really hard right now, and I can tell and I can see that things are going to be hard forever. I know that sounds really dramatic, um, and, and it is, but the fact is that we all do that. We all fall into that. The problem with this mentality is that it is not real. It's not real, it's not accurate. And and the problem with this mentality is that the enemy is gunning for you to to enter this mentality and then for you to stay in this mentality because there's no hope in this mentality. So this this is where the words of the wise kind of come in. The quickest way out of a crystal ball mentality is for someone to smack you upside the head and be like, This is what you're actually dealing with, and this is what you've made it out to be. This is what you're actually dealing with. You guys seen The Incredibles? Like, my daughter and I watched that a couple days ago. I love that movie. But she jumps up on the table, and she's like, pull yourself together with a magazine. That's kind of what I think about in this right here, right? Um, This is something that my mentor does all the time, and and it's it's whether it's welcome or not, like, he just kind of does it, so... (laughs) <laughs> when we have these words of wisdom, when we, when we exit this crystal ball mentality, we start to see things how they really are. We see that God is bigger than the hard things that we're dealing with. We see that our God cares for us and that our God loves us. And we see that our God is fighting for us. We don't lose sight of what's real. We don't lose sight of how God truly cares for us. So sometimes we need a little kick in the pants from those who are wiser than us, from those who can see the bigger picture, and from those who are going to help us regain that perspective. So maybe you don't feel like you have that person in your life. I'm going to speak bluntly right now, like look around you. Like, we are a community of Christ followers. Like, that is our job. It's our job to take care of one another. It's our job to speak those words of wisdom. And it's our job to bring things back into perspective for one another. Not just in the bad times, but the good times as well. We have to regain that perspective. And we also have to remember what the Lord has done. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me despite all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with pestilence and I will disinherit them. And I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. So these spies come back and they're like, hey, the land is great. And they're like, hey, you should kill them. A little bit of an overreaction, but they're very emotional right now. Then God God says to Moses, how long are they going to hate me? Despite of all the things that I've done for them. Now, before I said like the Israelites have been through a lot. And that was a bit of the understatement. So I told you that they had been in slavery for 
430 years, right? And uh, then God brought up Moses to deliver them out of that slavery. And here are just some of the things that he did with that. He turned the blood, or he turned the Nile into blood. And then he covered Egypt in frogs, and then he covered Egypt in gnats, then flies. Then he killed all the livestock of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. And then he covered the Egyptians with boils. It's kind of gross. And then he destroyed the Egyptians' remaining crops with hail, then locusts. And then he covered the Egyptians, but not the Israelites, with a darkness so thick that they couldn't see in front of their face. And then there was the death of all the Egyptians' firstborn. And that was just to get them out of Egypt. After that, God led them with a pillar of cloud by day and then a pillar of fire by night. How cool would that be to see, right? And then, my favorite part, he parts the Red Sea so the Israelites can escape from the Egyptians and then closes the Red Sea back on top of the Egyptian army, wiping the entire army out. They didn't have water. God gave them water. They didn't have food. God literally made food rain from the sky. They didn't have water again, so he gave them water. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that the Lord cares about what happens to these people? Yes. After hearing all that, do you think that he's going to send them into a land which he has promised them and say, oh, sorry, I forgot that they were stronger than you. (laughs) That doesn't make much sense, right? There are going to be times that we face difficult things, and there are going to be times that we are tested, that we lose perspective. And like the Israelites, there are going to be times that we question the goodness of God. And when the wisdom, when the words of wisdom do not cut it, that's when we have to look back at what the Lord has done and how he has been faithful in our lives before. By a show of hands, how many of you journal? How many of you blog? How many of you like, Write little notes about what's going on in your life. Okay. So I'm t- terrible at this. <laughs> like, but when, when I have done it, when I've been diligent about it, it's been amazing to see how it affects my relationship with the Lord. It's so interesting to go back and look at the things that I've written and look at the things that I'm like, Uh, that I've asked the Lord for, look at the things that I've struggled with. Normally what I would do is I would write out like just full on what what I would be praying. And I'm shocked when I go back and to see how the Lord answers those things. And the crazy thing is that they're rarely answered the way that I think that they should be answered. Side note, I I don't know about you, but for me, I'm kind of like, hey God, I know how you should be blessing me. I'm just waiting for you to get on the same page. Um, That doesn't work. So (laughs) I'm I'm slowly finding that out. Um, Is it always the way that I want it? No. Is it, and this is important, is it always going to be the easiest way? No. It's not. It's rarely. But it's God's answer. It reminds me that God is faithful. It can be that first step for me to to regain that faith and walk in to that unknown. Looking back can give us faith that we need to move forward into that unknown. If you don't write things down, I encourage you to do so somehow. And if you do write things down, I encourage you not to just let it sit in the pages of a book. I encourage you to to go back and read it. When we read it, that's when we see how the Lord has moved, right? Now, if you feel like you don't have have anything to look back on, like you're really in a funk, you've lost all perspective, Scripture is that thing that we look back at. I mean, I mean, look at this. Like, we, when sin entered the world, a gap was caused between man and God, a gap that could not be closed by man alone. And so God sent his only son to die on a cross so that the gap may be closed and that we may spend eternity with him. 
Just last week, we celebrated the arrival of Jesus Christ by looking at Christmas, by looking back at Christmas and what that means. Like, if, if that's not God's faithfulness, I don't, I don't know what is. In Psalm 77, it says, And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. We are, we are facing something hard. We are facing something that we can't see past. But then I recall all that you have done, O Lord, I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Like I said, we see this over and over and over again. If you feel like you're alone because you're struggling with your faith, you're not. If you're dealing with something really hard, maybe you lost somebody. Maybe you're struggling with something that that feels like it's overpowering your soul. Like you are not alone in that. As we enter this next season... As we enter this new year, whether you're feeling great about it, 2018 is going to rock, or whether you're completely and utterly dreading it. We have to, be, we have to realize that the fact is, is that we are going to be met with new blessings, and we are going to be met with new difficulties. So as we enter this new season, let us have the goal to not lose our faith. And to seek that wisdom so that we will not lose that perspective that's so important. And then, when we continue to struggle, let's remember what the Lord has done. Remember how the Lord has been faithful before. Just because we can't understand what's happening, just because we can't understand what the Lord does, does not mean that he's left us. We serve an awesome God who loves you very, very much. Sometimes, though, we do have to work to remember it. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you that you've given us stuff to look back at. I thank you that we serve an awesome God. God, as we enter this new season, God, I pray that you, that you will help us with our faith. It's not an easy thing. You know that. May we find wisdom. May we find that perspective that, that reminds us how awesome you are. And then may we also be reminded of the things that you've done. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for this church. I thank you for all these people. God, we thank you for your blessings and we thank you for who you are. In your name, amen.